Okay, uh, a very good day to you all. I'm uh, Kevin May. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Focus Wire and your host uh, for today's New Reality With. A uh, very warm welcome to all of you and thanks for watching this uh, ongoing series of one-to-one -one interviews with industry leaders and experts in the digital and business realm. Uh, this one again is brought to you uh, through a partnership through Salesforce. Uh, working with them, you can reopen travel with support from Salesforce's work.com. Um, the formalities are over. A uh, very warm welcome to uh, Rohit Tawar. He's uh, an author, a speaker, and the CEO. Your official job title, Rohit, is the uh, the CEO of Fast Future. So thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, on this kind of fairly warmish uh, late August uh, afternoon from the UK. You're in the UK as well. So uh, welcome, Rohit. Just uh, for those for those of you uh, that are tuning in and watching on the replay that don't know, just give us a 30 seconds on what is Fast Future and what would you say your core expertise are before we kind of dive in with our questions? Well, firstly, hello and uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, hello to everyone who's watching either live or on uh, a recording afterwards. So at Fast Future, we do a number of things around exploring the future. And we have a particular focus on sectors like travel, tourism, aviation, and the meetings industry. And what we try and do is explore the ideas, the forces, the trends, the developments, and the unseen possibilities such as the pandemic, uh, and how they might impact the future of these industry sectors, what scenarios could play out, and what strategies do you need to adopt then to make sure that you don't get caught out by any possible scenario or that you're prepared for the worst case scenario? Okay, right. Um, the inspiration for us getting in touch with you, Rohit, as I was just explaining in our green room before we went live, was a, a, a truly excellent webinar that you, uh, that, um, that you put on a couple of weeks ago, which coincided with uh, the release of uh, a report that we'll put a link to for everyone to take a look at that as well. And in that webinar, you outlined um, four scenarios for travel, tourism and hospitality, our, our industry that we all know has been pretty much decimated um, as a result of what's been going on over the last six or seven months. So I thought to kick us off first, Rohit, if you could uh, give us your overview of what those four scenarios are, and then we can dive in and debate and discuss those and where you see things are at the moment with relation to the industry and those four scenarios, if you could. Sure. So the way we approached developing the scenarios were to look for what we thought were the two most important driving forces, uh, which have potentially the most impact on the next few years for the industry, but also are most uncertain. And the two we chose were the evolution of the pandemic, which could go from you know, rapid eradication through to a very extended uh, period in which it's having an impact, and then the nature of the economic recovery from deep and prolonged downturn through to a more vibrant bounce back. And so if you imagine those being two axes, you end up with four quadrants, uh, which give you four possible scenarios. So the four scenarios that came out of that, the first was what we're calling end of an era. Let's call that the worst case scenario, where you have a prolonged pandemic, deep downturn, we don't come out of the pandemic till 22, 23, because we don't have a vaccine till then, uh, until we tackle the problems of the countries uh, with the weakest economies and the most fragile of health systems. We don't tackle it anywhere because the pandemic travels around the world in seat 43C of an aircraft. Uh, and in that scenario, we also have a very prolonged economic downturn. We don't really see the global economy returning to anything like its state in 2019 until maybe 2022 or, or 2023. And for these sectors, uh, really, we're looking at sometime between 2023 and 2025 for them to recover to somewhere close to where they were in 2019, if at all. Um, the second scenario is one that we call Dancing in the Dark, where eventually countries accept that they can't keep trying to reset their economy while the pandemic's there. So they put all their effort into getting the pandemic uh, dealt with. The recovery is slower, but it's more sustainable when it happens because you've taken out the uncertainty around the pandemic. People are vaccinated or there's cures. 
you've got widespread testing, so you, you're not worried about people going back into the economy. The third one we call in digital first, which is what's really sort of happening now, where the pandemic hasn't been eradicated. We're locking down parts of countries where there are spikes, and and we've got a hesitant economic recovery going on. But really, it's a digital first recovery in this sector where companies are saying that we'll try and do as much as we can digitally. We might have the odd hybrid event. We might send a few people out on business travel, but we're not going to place a big amount of demand on on that on live events. And individual travellers will go to destinations, but as soon as there's a problem, that destination gets decimated. And we've just seen that happen in Malaga in Spain and across yeah. Spain. Uh, that's happened. And then the fourth scenario, I guess, is the most optimistic one, which we're calling smarter but smaller. And that's an industry where we've learned a lot from this. We get over the pandemic uh, through the course of 2021 and early 2022. We get widespread rapid vaccination. The economy comes back. There's concerted efforts by governments and businesses to invest, to grow, to create jobs, to invest in new sectors. The, the, the sectors we're talking about here, in particular travel, tourism, hospitality, use the time to get greener, to use technology more effectively, to get closer to their customers. So we come out smarter, but the, it's unlikely that we're going to come out bigger. It feels like in the next two to three years, the best we can hope for is about 80% of where we were in 2019. We might get back to 100% of 2019 by 2025, but that's going to take a lot of effort to get there. And the big determinant there are the, the big economies like the US and India and China to some extent. If they have prolonged downturns, they that will have a massive global footprint and just delay the recovery everywhere for a lot longer. Now, um, the the X and the Y axis that you spoke of in the actual webinar, that was called the, the driving force model. Yeah. I, I, that's yep. what that's the name for it. And I, I sensed from watching that webinar and there was a and a afterwards with some of your guests on that and um, that you were fairly pessimistic about where we were. I think it was three or four weeks ago, wasn't it, when that was first broadcast. Um, do you, has your pessimism eased or do you think it's gotten worse? I mean, in other words, you did say you thought we were on a kind of a digital first scenario at the moment but there are some things that would indicate that we are in other quadrants there where where would yeah. you say we are so from a, from a behavioral point of view we're definitely in that scenario where the pandemic isn't eradicated but we're trying to restart economies and so we're trying to get sectors like travel and tourism going again people are now launching live meetings with social distancing instead of 200 delegates, they've got 40. So that's all happening, but it's very hesitant. And most organizations are saying, rather than take the risk, let's do everything digitally. And so that's sort of driving that. Individuals are saying, yes, let me go out, but they're, they're, they're staycationing more than they're traveling internationally. And so not, it's not so much about being pessimistic, it's just about an objective view of where we are, which is that this is a once in 100 year you know, health event and a one in 300 years economic event. Mm -hmm. And we don't recover from those quickly. There are many candidate vaccines, but we have to balance the optimism and, and President Trump has just announced that he's gonna fast track some of these vaccines we have to balance that with the history of vaccines, which is that some of the biggest uh, viral-related health issues in society still don't have a vaccine. So whether that's HIV, Ebola, SARS, 10 years on, we still don't have a vaccine for some of those. And it's not because we're not trying. It's because it's very hard to develop effective vaccines. So if we get a vaccine sometime next year, that'll be a bit of a miracle but it's still going to take a couple of years to roll that out globally. So that's a kind of realistic view of where we are. And on the economic front, we've got two things going on. We've got the immediate fallout of the pandemic 
and countries slowing down and then a faltering recovery, large numbers of redundancies in the US, 40 million plus added to the unemployment register in the UK, about a million people added, plus still something like 7 million on furlough. Once they come out, more will go into unemployment. But as soon as we come out, we're also going to be hit by a wave of automation that a lot of businesses have used this opportunity to say, let's accelerate automation of what we do so we're less exposed to humans, but let's also do things faster. And, And particularly this working from home business has really demonstrated to a lot of companies that you can do a lot more with technology than they gave themselves permission to believe. And now we're going to see all of the AI tools from basic expert systems and robotic process automation through to much smarter stuff, chatbots, robo-advisors, robots doing service. That's coming, that's happening. And so that's going to carry on depressing the economy in terms of taking jobs out. So the, the, the challenge here is not about seeing this as pessimistic. It's about recognizing that this is, this is a kind of realistic view of what's happening and planning for it and making sure that we're planning for those difficult scenarios as well as hoping for the best. So it's almost uh, like a pessimistic realism, really, or, or optimistic realism, depending whether you're half full or half empty almost. Yeah, I think pessimism and optimism are, um, are not really useful tools in this environment. <laughs> I, th- I think hard pragmatism, uh, yeah. you know, so pessimism and optimism are, are kind of emotional tools that you can look at and say, in normal times, you know, I'm optimistic about our forecast about how much we're going to grow visitor numbers to our attraction, or I'm pessimistic that we will do that. It's an emotional thing. Now this is about hard logic of how is this playing out? How is this affecting business behavior? How is this affecting things like insurance policies? How is this affecting company travel policies? How is it affecting consumer policies? And and, and really understanding what's going on and then crafting strategy based on the logic, not what would have worked six months ago. And that's the really difficult thing because none of us like letting go of, of those assumptions, those sacred cows, those rocks in the sand that we used to cling on to because they've all been obliterated. Now, now, I think this is the, I think it will be the 14th or 15th interview that we've done in this series. And certainly in the first half of them, when we had um, some of the CEOs of some of the biggest brands on the planet. So um, Peter Kern, the CEO of Expedia Group, was one of our guests uh, the CEO of Travago. We've had many, many. And one of the questions that we liked to ask them, because this was, you know, eight, nine weeks ago, was, you know, were you prepared for this to happen in terms of your disaster, your crisis management strategy preparation that every company should have? Was this something on this scale that you were ever prepared for? And they all admitted um, to a fault that no, this wasn't the kind of a scenario that we had kind of envisaged. Now, obviously, hindsight 2020 is great, and they'll be thinking, well, we need to plan for this well, um, in the, in the, for these kind of things to repeat in the future. One of the things that you said in your, in your webinar is that brands should be preparing for all of these scenarios rather than the one that they like the most, the one that they want to fit into. Now, that's both a strategic problem and also a mindset problem, would you agree, that you have to kind of prepare for all of them rather than, as you said, the one that you kind of want to fit into? Yeah, and and it's easier to prepare for scenarios where it's hopeful that things are going to improve, that we're going to get more travellers, we're going to get more people flying, we're going to get more people coming to events. We're all of those are going to drive more people coming to our hotels. Those are the easiest scenario to prepare for because it's about how do we maximize our share of the cake. The tough one is that one that says you have no control over how many people are going to travel. And this shock that we've had where effectively we said, you're going to have no customers. That's not a scenario that most organizations are willing to even think about. 
Right. Now we have clients where effectively once a week we're doing a workout on an issue like that. What is something that might happen? Let's forget about what it is, but imagine something happened that took away all your business or where someone came along and offered the same proposition for half the price or whatever, that you take these shocks and you force yourselves to work through them. You don't argue about whether they will happen or not. You just focus on the impacts. And right now, this is what everybody in the travel value chain is having to think about because effectively we've said, okay, we've taken away all, pretty much all your business. Now what are you going to do to survive? And they haven't done that thinking. Hotels haven't thought about, well, how will we repurpose our facilities? So right now, you know, who wants expansion space? Well, it's universities. They need places to put all their students because they can't be in the same lecture theatres. It's schools that need places to put socially distant students. It's workplaces that are saying, okay, we need to have a certain number of people in, but we haven't actually got enough space to socially distance them. So can we rent some temporary reconfigurable space that might be a meeting room or uh, an exhibition centre? It's retail saying, you know what, it's retailers saying, you know what, I don't want a high street outlet anymore. What I want to be able to do is to go in and use pop-up facilities in a socially distant space where you've taken care of all the, the one-way flows and everything, and I've just got my booth where I can pitch up with my stock, sell for a day and then disappear again. So it's really rethinking how, you know, those kind of things about how would we generate revenue. So it's, it's all the agencies in the value chain. There's no point being a destination management company right now if no one's coming to your destination. You've got to think about what else do you do to either sell electronic versions of the destination or create other propositions or create insurance policies that companies can't get but allow travellers to come where you're doing the insurance. It's requiring the whole industry to say, how do we reuse our capacity? How do we think differently? And how do we work on the bigger picture which gets travellers coming? Most people have thought that was the responsibility of governments. Very, very slowly, the airports, airlines, hotels, and everyone's realizing that unless you have consistency of experience, travelers are going to be nervous. So if I'm going from the UK to somewhere in Spain and I don't get tested at Gatwick, but I get tested on arrival in Spain and I fill in a 10 page form, and then the hotel does nothing when I get there, but tests me on departure, that's inconsistent. What am I going to do? I'm going to tell social media about that. I'm going to tell all my friends about that. Whereas if I had the same experience all the way through, I would say how safe and secure it felt and I'd actually drive up traveler numbers. So the industry needs to think bigger, needs to think about collaboration, much more coordination and having very simple mechanisms. This isn't about airports out competing each other for who's got the best heat seat, you know, sensing technology. This is about making sure that you've got the same experience everywhere. You might use different technologies. That's a real challenge for the industry to, to think that way. Uh, we'll, we'll drill down into one of the um, one of those particular ones that you referenced before, which is secure end-to-end -end solutions. So we'll come back to that in a minute because it's a really interesting example, and I think has almost kind of not only social but economic ramifications. But as I said, we'll come back to that. One of the things that's happened recently, and you talked, uh, Rohit, just a moment ago about governments intervening and uh, supporting this, and this is this idea of mass intervention by whether it's states governments or regional bodies like the eu or the africa equivalent or asean in southeast asia things in latin america now the wttc the world travel and tourism council last week had this signed letter by 120 ceos of the travel industry saying we are on our i'm paraphrasing here but you know we are on our knees and we really, if this industry, the world's, one of the world's biggest industries, $9 trillion G uh, GDP, is to get back on its knees or get back on its feet because it's on its knees, it's going to require coordinated response from states, which is going to come at a cost. Do you think there is an appetite for that level of intervention from states to help this travel, tourism and hospitality industry? Do they understand its value? or is there the wherewithal for them to do so, given that it is, some would argue, needed? Well, in short, no. 
Um, and, and there are a few reasons for that. One is uh, it's a lot of money uh, at a time when countries are borrowing huge amounts of money with deep uncertainty about whether they can pay it back. If I'm the UK or I'm a, a, a AAA rated country, I can borrow that money at kind of 0.1 of 0.1% interest rate. So we've just finished paying for World War One. You know, we can stretch that out at no, almost no cost. Yeah. If I'm a country with a triple E rating, who am I going to borrow the money from? And how am I going to pay back the 15 to 20% interest on that money? So the first is the sheer cost. The second is a very pragmatic view that says, well, how big is your industry going to be in the future? Forget what you were. What are you going to look like in one, two, three years' time if I give you the money? And if I give you the money and you don't recover because people aren't traveling, companies aren't sending people out you know, for business meetings as much, we're doing a lot more virtually, we're doing our events more virtually, then the question is, well, how, you know, what, what will you recover to? And therefore, how much do I put into you? And is there a risk of me pouring good money off the bat? Right. And the final one is, you're not the only people asking for money. So this industry is asking for money. And, and yes, there are some really high uh, skill jobs in the industry. There's pe- more and more technology jobs. There's more and more food science jobs, managerial jobs. But there's an awful lot of relatively low skilled, if you like, jobs and the medium skilled jobs that are less value creating so if I've got the choice of putting a million dollars into a hotel or putting a million dollars into a synthetic biology company that can create me a future cure, where am I going to put that money? And what does the return on my money look like? If, you know, if I'd taken a million dollars last year and put it into Hilton, no offense to Hilton, but I'd be worth about half the money I put in. If I would put that same million dollars into Apple last year, it would be worth $2 million now. You know, they've gone from a trillion dollars to $2 trillion. So, so governments are faced with tough choices about which sectors do we put the money into, which are going to create the most high-end jobs and therefore the most value-creating jobs, and which are the industries of the future we want to support most, and kind of accepting that maybe we're just going to pick up the economic cost of a lot of jobs lost. And that's what the conversation we hear from a lot of governments is they hear the request, they hear the appeals, but that there's, there's a kind of harsh economic reality being applied to say, where best can we use the money that we have got? Where, and where does travel, tourism and meetings fit in our, our hierarchy of priorities? And it's unfortunate for the industry that right now a lot of other sectors are being prioritised above travel and tourism. So... Um, With all that said then, Rohit, it's down to the industry itself and perhaps even the individual brands to to think smarter and to come up with new ways for them to fit into, to coin the title of our series here, the new reality of what their future might be, even if it is smaller, by being smarter and smaller, that's the kind of the optimistic scenario for them then. Well, the industry is definitely getting smaller. I mean, we can see that now with hotel yeah, closures, sure. redundancies. The question is, are we getting smarter? Are we saying, what does our recovery look like? So, you know, there's, there's four things we know that we need to do for the future. Uh, one is we need to be more sustainable. We need to stop talking about it and really start setting very high standards so that people don't feel like they're compromising their environmental footprint by coming to a hotel or taking a flight or whatever. Secondly, we need to get much smarter in our use of technology. And that isn't about spending more. That's about investing a lot more in our digital literacy and our understanding of what the technology could do. And then making much smarter choices about how we use the technology to underpin service delivery. The third is about generally training our people. So, Are we training them to think differently, to come up with those creative ideas about how we use our facilities, how we attract back the kinds of customers who might travel, how we create innovative 
you know, sealed bubble travel experiences. From, so from the moment you leave home to the moment you get to our hotel, you know, you don't touch anyone that might have a, a, a virus. Uh, and the final and most important one is one that really isn't a surprise to the industry. It's about quality of training overall. You know, are we training people to deliver the most exceptional service experience imaginable, whether we're a six-star property or we're a no-star bed and breakfast or, you know, anywhere in between? And, and people always say training has a cost. The, the cost of training is far less than the cost of not training. Right. And, and but we don't see that. And, and so I think, you know, you put those four together and you've got a bit of a plan to start your recovery. Now, it, I think the, the, the travel industry, uh, I think it would be fair to say that many brands um, would be, and I'm going back to something that you said in the webinar, is that, you know, brands need to think about logic versus emotion. Mm. And often travel is a very emotive because it's an experiential for its uh, end user, but I think it's often run in an emotive way as well. I mean, there's going to be some casualties along the way, I would imagine, if brands continue to think with their emotions rather than their logic about what this new reality, new normal, whatever we want to call it, is going to be, right? Absolutely. And, and the question we would ask of management teams of the big brands, let's say the hotels, is what is the proportion of the time they spend on thinking about things like acquisitions, adding to the brand portfolio, who can we buy, what can we sell, versus thinking about how are we enhancing the guest experience? How are we improving the way we use technology to enhance what we do as an organization? How are we differentiating ourselves? If anyone, if amongst the senior team of an organization, if across that team, the number is above 50%, A, they're probably lying, and B, they're exceptional. Um, because most just spend a huge amount of time, or they spend a lot of time on what you might call dishwashing. You know, routine issues that they should be delegating. And when you come to the end of the year, they won't remember they even dealt with them. This is the time to be re being really strategic, really thinking about the experience. You know, what are we doing in the next three months to just stay alive? but it's still quite strategic because it's staying alive. What do we need to do for the next three to 12 months to start creating those new revenue streams, to start enhancing our training, to differentiate ourselves? And then what do we need to be doing for the longer term that takes advantage of all this innovation in science and technology of new thinking to say, how do we change our business? How do we change the way we present to the marketplace? Maybe with new business models, all sorts of new ideas. But a good leadership team is focusing on those things. And you know, I'm horrified at the amount of time I, I'm hearing now, the amount of reading I'm doing about people talking about acquisitions. You know, company A wants to buy brand B. And you know, you're like, you already have 17 brands in your portfolio. What does adding another 16 brands do to a loss-making portfolio? It just gives you 33 brands to worry about. Right. And, yes. and then you've got a whole program of redundancies to manage because you don't want, you know, 18 corporate heads of marketing. And, you know, so you end up just focusing on all of that stuff when really you need to be doing the brand enhancing stuff, which is the, stra you know, the strategy stuff and the experience in improvement stuff. Now, what's interesting, and you, you, you referenced M&A there, I mean, the powerhouses in this industry – are often the vast majority of them are public companies where they have a fiduciary a fiduciary responsibilities for to maximize profits because they're listed on the stock exchanges etc cetera, etc cetera. that perhaps doesn't chime with the the kind of the the other stuff that you're talking about which is deeper thinking trying to get smarter at the expense perhaps for short term financial gain but more long-term survival. I mean, how do they approach something like this where they have to show the numbers every quarter? And, and you know, to bring us right up to speed, I mean, Airbnb last week said it was going to um, go for its IPO, its public listing, which seems to some that perhaps that's the wrong timing because it needs to do some of the things that you're referencing. Uh, actually, I think it's perfect timing for them because yeah. uh, if you go to search any destination now, you'll find less rooms available on Airbnb than you will on the hotel sites. 
right. travelers are switching to Airbnb for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. There's a very big shift happened in the pandemic. And, and Airbnb, it's a lot easier to interrogate the, the property owner about what are, the, what are the hygiene standards you've adopted. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can trust that they're doing it. In a big hotel, you can never be sure. You hope, and you will assure that the brand promises will do it. But how do you know, how do you know for sure? Like in a, an Airbnb, a simple one, Airbnb advise that they don't clean the bathroom that the guest has used for three hours after the guest has last used it. How is someone in a thousand bed property going to know when I last used the bathroom? Whereas in an Airbnb, they can hear. You know, so, so there are just some little <laughs> things there that, that, that change there, yeah? and, and they know when you've left out the property. And, um, so I think um, there's a natural thing to do there. I think for the, you know, the boards or the, the, the executive management teams, what drives them, I guess, is what is the business model of the organization. If you're a portfolio of brands and you don't actually own any of the properties, you know, you have relationships with property owners, you provide management services, then really you should be trying to maximize the value of the brand out in the marketplace because your share of, of the revenues, you know, like if your, your share of revenue grows as the property owner's revenues grow. If you own a lot of properties, then largely you're in the business of real estate management and, and you make your money out of buying and selling property and the growth in property values over time. That's, you, know, you, you look at the balance sheets of a lot of pub companies, they're exactly like that. They make almost no money out of selling beer, they make their money out of property. And, and so the challenge for a lot of players in the industry is you know, what's our business model? And how do we make it work on the service side of things, the hotel experience side of things, in this market where property values probably aren't gonna go up massively in the near future, some hotels are going to go bust, means there are going to be more properties on the market. So, you know, our, our ability to generate high returns on the sale of properties is going to be harder. Yes, there's always going to be someone out there wanting to buy a property for portfolio because it feels safe. You know, sovereign wealth funds have, you know, billions of dollars they have to put somewhere. So buying a hotel chain or buying a group of hotels seems like a good deal. And the same with all sorts of investment funds. But Right now, I think that the brands that could do best in this environment are the ones who really put the focus on enhancing the guest experience, on finding new revenue streams from the properties they've got, you know, whether it's selling your cooking lessons online, home delivery of food kits, bringing you in to do socially distanced cooking classes, you know, running all sorts of socially distanced events in the property turning each bedroom over to becoming a, a, a local working unit for businesses where they yeah. can three members of staff in because they happen to live locally and, and all that kind of stuff. It, but it requires imagination. It requires a very different way of thinking about what we're trying to do as a business. Now, it's interesting on that, you know, uh, repurposing facilities, reusing facilities in a different kind of way. I mean, that's something, you know, often strategic developments in accommodation for example um are often only available to those that can move quickly or have the investment to do so whether you're a hotel chain but this gives an opportunity from the top of the kind of the hospitality tree down to the bottom so for example i I quite like the idea of repurposing for you know um i guess co-working spaces and things like that because yeah. existing ones and that could be done from by the biggest hotel chain right down to um, a, a hostel that's perhaps being underutilized for example that's something that in theory could be um, altered very quickly almost absolutely and, and the good thing about it is you know what does that person need they have their laptop they need the ability to connect to good quality wi-fi or you know get access yeah. to the vpn and they need some sort of surface to work on you've already got at least one desk in most ho- hotel rooms. So you right. just need to bring in a table or something. You know, it's not a lot, but the question is, how do you then price it? If you say, well, we would have got $500 a night for this room. So we'll charge, you know, we'll let two people in and we'll charge them $250 a day. You're not really. <laughs> no. But if you start pitching it at 30 to $50 a day, you take off $5 a day for cleaning. 
you're taking an asset that otherwise wouldn't yield anything yeah. and you're generating some returns on it. I'm not suggesting that you're going to grow rich from doing this, but it might at some point take you to an interesting proposition that says, well, what level of accommodation do we give over for genuine accommodation? And what level is this, you know, temporary workspace stuff that's becoming permanent workspace stuff? Yeah, I don't know. But we, we are, what we do know is that we're going to have a lot more owner-managed businesses in the next three to five years as yep. people come out of the workforce, create their own businesses, don't want to do it all from home or grow enough that they need a bit of space with one member of staff. Hotels, convention centers, players in this space could get in there relatively easily. What it requires is much more of a mindset shift than a physical change in the layout of your property. The physical change. Yeah, well, obviously, as I was saying right at the beginning, Rohit, we'll put a link to the full webinar because there's uh, the, the second half of that discussion is 10 methods to unlock opportunity in crisis. And um, sadly, we can't go through all 10 of them now, although all 10 are really, really interesting. So I'd like to so say if, if for those of you that are watching can go and read the full 10, but there's a couple that I'd like to get through now if we can. And one is that I mentioned at the beginning of our of our chat was this securing end-to-end -end solutions and an example that you gave when you were talking about it in your webinar was this um i think it was uh, a, a company i don't know whether it was a middle east company or a russian company but that effectively set up a it's almost like a package trip from a location at an airport in Russia, at a private jet that took people to one of the Emirates in, in the Middle East. You were tested on the way out. You were tested on arrival. I'm going over the details a little bit here. Mm. But uh, um, everyone that was on the trip stayed with everybody else. The staff were all secure. It was almost like a lockdown trip. Exactly. And, and, and you end up in a, a wonderful location, and many of the hotels in the Middle East are wonderful co locations, and you were there for a week or whatever. And you, and, you, know, you can see uh, that idea springing up in different types of almost package bubbles. Now, my question is, does that therefore create almost an elitism within travel, if that is going to be perhaps one of the only types of ways as we go forward over the next couple of years where those kind of trips are going to be possible, that it essentially becomes something for the maybe not the ultra rich but for those that have got a little bit more money than certainly I have to go and experience that type of trip inevitably uh, and and we already have that kind of segmentation in the marketplace so you know the people who are paying 35 euros for a flight you know with seats that don't recline from destination a to destination b yeah. paying the equivalent of 14 pounds a night for their hotel room including three meals they're not the market you're, you're targeting you're talking about the people who are willing to spend you know 200 to 500 pounds a night you know pay for a, you know decent flights and you are putting them in this sort of hermetically sealed bubble uh, you're testing them before they fly so that you know that they've had you know within 24 hours of flying they've had a, a, a negative test for COVID-19, all the staff have had the same, you take them through, they stay in a single resort for the whole time they're there. This was in Ras al Khaimah. You go through a dedicated part of the airport, it's quite a small airport. You can't replicate that everywhere. You know, it would be hard to do that through, say, Heathrow, but you might. You might say, you know, you take one terminal at Heathrow and it's just for that for the next year. Uh, and... It is for an upmarket segment, and there are all sorts of social and moral issues around that. Yeah. But we already have holidays that cost more than many people earn in a year. Mm. Right? You know, so so we hear about Ronaldo hiring a <laughs> villa or the Greek resort where literally he has paid more for a three day stay than the average income of people in the UK. So yeah. you know, we're already in that space. So. I think the industry probably doesn't need to be worried about being criticised for being uh, elitist in this. It's trying to generate some revenue, but maybe it uses some of that money to do other good things. But, you, you know, if you want to get some occupancy, you're going to have to explore these ideas. 
and I suppose th- following on from that theme then, um, you know, the 90s, and I'm paraphrasing many a low-cost carrier CEO here, but, you know, the 90s were often billed as the period where there was a kind of a, it was the democratization of travel, where anyone really could jump on a plane for 30, 40 quid and go and spend a weekend in Barcelona um, at a fairly reasonably priced hotel or any other getaway destination where we are in Europe, for example. But those kind of trips perhaps aren't going to be possible. So uh, have we entered an era where travel is less democratized and a little bit more for those that just generally, not just this example of Russia and that uh, wonderful place in the Emirates, um, but is that perhaps uh, something that we just need to kind of suck it up, really, that we have entered a different kind of era where not everybody is going to be able to go to most destinations for an affordable price? I think a number of forces at play here. Short answer, yes, we are in that. But but what's also happening is people are losing their jobs. So, And a lot of those are at the bottom end of the spectrum who might have travelled. They might staycation now just to save some money or not travel at all. Then you've got people who are moving down in their spending. I think it's going to be very difficult for the hotels to raise their prices. And as and sorry, the airlines, they're trying, but you know, I think it's going to be very difficult because demand is, is a bit soggy still. So I think what will happen is a lot of what will happen is that those same prices will be there, but the segment who are taking advantage of them are sort of up market. Uh, you know, it's like the next stage in the market. Uh, and it will be some time before people at the lower end of the market are earning enough and feel safe enough to travel overseas. So, yes, that's going to happen. And big question about how many of those airlines can survive? How long can they keep getting government debt for, you know, ridiculously low, low prices? Uh, which is what you know a lot of the UK airlines have done, and the same has happened in other countries. There will come a point where governments going to you can't sell us any more of your bonds because we can't see a way out for you. Uh, and in the same way as we talked about hotels, you're going to see the same with airlines, where at some point someone is going to say no more, yeah. uh, and then they've got a real challenge because if they run on a low cost model and they don't have enough people flying with them they've got no they haven't really got many places to go and you can't repurpose an aircraft in quite the same way as you can repurpose a hotel or a convention center yes you can turn a few of them into hotels but you can't have you know if you've got 120 uh you know whatever's uh a318s you can't really turn them all into hotels particularly when demand for hotels isn't that strong um, and, and, and last of all, and I loathe to say that we're tackling this one last of all because it's the least important, but on, on the contrary, because I think it feeds through a lot of all of what we've discussed, and you did reference it very briefly at the beginning, and that's the issue of sustainability. And um, based on what you were saying previously on your webinar and just like uh, just general discussions that we've had with people, there is... One side that's saying, well, you know, it's kind of got to go on the back burner for a little while because we just need to get up and running. And then there is what you were saying, which is this is the opportunity when we rethink and we become smarter, maybe a little smaller, but we do things in a sustainable way because we are going to completely knacker everything if we don't think about things in a sustainable way. That's what you're thinking. That's what other people are thinking. But my question is, and my worry is, is is the industry thinking in a sustainable future kind of way or are they just thinking in an operational kind of way? So some are doing really good thinking and we see a lot of really interesting initiatives and, yep. uh, you know, there's lots to commend the industry for. But the thinking needs to get bigger. So the sustainable development goals from the UN don't just cover things like water and air quality. They cover a much broader aspect of sustainability. So whether it's education, whether it's gender equality, whether it's access to opportunities, whether it's the creation of new jobs, it's all of those things. And so not every organization has to tackle all of the goals, but we can all start thinking about where can we make the most contribution. 
if we're educating our staff more and, and teaching them about sustainability at its basic level, then we can do a lot of very good things very quickly, like eliminating waste, making smarter use of our, you know, the, the way we do cleaning and the products we use, all that kind of stuff. But then there's bigger picture things we can do, like opportunities for women. What proportion of your management team are women? And, and how long will it take to get to parity? Uh, and really starting to make some tough choices there about, you know, we, we've had bias in one direction for the last 200 years. What do we do to get more women in the other way? And, and start, and, you know, minorities of all kinds. And really starting to think about how can we make a bigger leap forward on these various things so we can create a more sustainable future, which benefits everyone and makes our brand stand out more. And that's, that's the key thing, I think, that if you get this right, it really becomes very powerful as a brand. It's not the thing that's going to lead the recovery, but it's one of the key elements that will sustain it uh, going forward. So we started off with, um, we talked a lot about pessimism and, you know, the uh, uh, the end of an era scenario and things that, you know, it, it is a bit of a worrying time. But I've liked the fact that we've ended on, you know, a, a hopeful, positive note in that if you seize the opportunity with things around sustainability and diversity and inclusion and those kind of things, and one of those more optimistic scenarios is the way that we kind of emerge from this. The industry could actually end up being, as we said, smarter and smaller, but a better industry for everybody almost. Absolutely. And, and you know, smarter but smaller is, is the next few years. Hopefully smarter and maybe bigger is yeah. the longer term. But it, that is the choice we're going to make. And, and that choice is dependent on all those things we talked about around it investing in sustainability, using technology in a smarter way, training people and delivering more exceptional service. And that in turn talks to the, you know, the conversation we had about where does leadership spend its time and are we spending enough time on those elements of the proposition versus the mergers and acquisitions type stuff? Yeah. Okay. So uh, there are a bunch of things that we didn't get a chance to talk about there was a uh, uh, business travel and the insurance industry the events industry we really didn't tackle at all and there's some really fantastic stuff in the webinar about that and uh, another one about rethinking uh, the experience and the delivery of it much more collaboration between say hotels and attractions based on mm -hmm. hygiene and things like that so there's a bunch of things for those that are watching this that I strongly encourage you uh, to go and see like I said at the beginning we'll uh, we'll put a link on uh, uh, on this story on the replay that so people can go and listen to the full uh, webinar and also um, check out the report. So, um, you know, it's come to the end of another new reality with. Uh, first of all, we'd like to say huge thanks to Rohit Tower for joining us. That was that was terrific. It was a, a really, really interesting uh, discussion and I'm glad we covered not everything, but some of the things in really great detail. Uh, we'd also like to thank our sponsor, Salesforce, again, for working with us on these one-to-one -one interviews, uh, looking into the second half of 2020 and beyond. You can embark on a new safe era of travel with Salesforce CRM. Uh, many more details about that particular initiative from Salesforce will also put on the replay that accompanies this, um, I'll say again, excellent interview. Thank you so much, uh, Rohit Tower, for joining us uh, from Fast For You. I really appreciate your time. Stay well and all the best. Thanks a lot. Thank you. My pleasure.